Hello friends, welcome to the video manual for RapidFlow on Bitwig. Let me give you a quick demo of what this template does and then I'm going to go in depth and explain what every bit does and especially how you can connect your controller to make tracks in real time. All right. You can do with it. What I'm doing here is I'm controlling uh, the template using this uh, APC40. Uh, and yeah, uh, let me show you what it sounds like. So as you may have seen, uh, what I've been doing in essence is modulating the sound coming off of the template in real time using this controller. I'm going to show you exactly how to set it up. Um, and uh, let's go back quickly to the template to give you a quick overview of what's included here. So we have eight tracks um, in the beginning of the template, which is exactly what matches up to most controllers that have eight faders. And the idea is that you can bring in and out elements in your, temp in your uh, track using your faders to create your sequence in real time. Um, as you can see, all the faders in the project are set up uh, so that they are mixed correctly at the very top of their travel. This is a trick uh, that I uh, learned watching some video from uh, Paul Kagbrenner, uh, which uh, he does apparently, I think, with a Mackie mixer, which means that he gains everything so that when his faders are all the way up, the mix is correct. Uh, so that means that on the APC, when you have all your faders up, you know that it's going to sound the way you designed the track, which is, I think, a really great uh, way to go. Uh, inside each of these um, tracks, there's a lot of elements to make sure that these tracks sound correct. So if we can, if we look at, uh, for example, the drums track, which is the first track here to begin with, you will see that, of course, we have a sampler that's taking care of the uh, sounds that we're playing. But we also have a lot of uh, sound engineering built into this template. So my, my background is uh, as it's in sound engineering. I studied at SAE in the 90s uh, and I've worked for 25 years as a musician and sound engineer. And my goal with making these templates was to create a structure in which people could have a really good sounding uh, demo or sketch of a track and a really fast workflow that I've learned over the years working with other people and doing master classes. So a lot of my sound engineering knowledge has been put into this so that from the get-go you get a really strong sounding clean mix. Uh, and when you start adding your elements to this, um, you can't really go wrong. Uh, the way it's set up makes sure that um, the output that you get is correct. So the, the tracks, sometimes people ask us this, you know, well, what am I going to do with these tracks or, you know, how can I use this? The idea with these tracks is just to give you some demos of what the template can sound like. Once you have the level set right, I expect that you will delete all the audio clips here and actually maybe just keep the drum uh, samples. Probably you'll replace those with your drum sounds, but um, the idea is that you use this to make your own tracks and obviously not to use this to make uh, tracks that sound like my demos because that would be kind of pointless. <laughs> so um, the one exception maybe would be in the drum sampler. We have uh, hi-hat samples in there which are a little bit different in that they're very long and there's a reason for that. Namely, when you play uh, the drums, you can morph the length of the hi-hats to better suit your tracks. So you see I've selected a hi-hat now. It's a very long sample, but listen to what it sounds like um, when I play it and tweak uh, the controller that's mapped to the Hi-Hat Decay. And the idea with that is that you can get the groove to work right for whatever kind of track you're working on, but also you can use it kind of to do build-ups with it like that. go 
you can go from a very short kind of uh, clicky hi-hat to quite a long groovy one. Maybe you open it up for your choruses or something like that. Um, so coming back to the tracks, we have these eight tracks and uh, four of them are based on uh, rhythmic elements, uh, the first four. So we have a kick drum, we have a bass obviously, uh, a groove which is where I usually put toms and then a percussion track. And then we have four melodic uh, and harmonic um, tracks. Um, actually I'm using three only for melodics and harmonics and a lead or a vo vocal. Uh, and there's one track also which can be used for putting in sound effects, white noise, uh, maybe you know samples of people speaking or whatever it is that you want to drop in there, found sounds. Um, and uh, yeah, we have like a lead sound, a harmony sound uh, and a, a vocal or maybe a, a hook sound that you could add in there. Um, and the idea of having so few tracks um, to create your song with, to begin with, to make a sketch with, I should emphasize, is that you will be forced to really look for elements that work amazingly together and really add something to the track. Because one of the things that I've picked up working as a musician is that it's very tempting in a doll that can do so much to just keep adding more and more and more and more tracks and eventually you think, yeah, it sounds kind of good, but it doesn't really, really catch you. And um, what many people, I think, that aren't producers, what they do when they listen to a song is, you know, does it move them and does it somehow mean something to them? Um, and if you just have like thousands of sounds or let's say like dozens of sounds piled on top of each other, most people that aren't producers and have a trained ear can't even really hook onto those. And if you listen to a lot of the songs out there that are, you know, somehow, I guess you could say popular or successful, they tend to have a very, quite, quite a simple structure and very clear elements that really stand out in the mix and often that interact with each other. So the idea here is to make um, a sketch of what your track uh, would be like with just these eight tracks. And once you have something that you think sounds really good, you can take it to a club, play it live, just using the faders, um, you know, and sequence it live on stage. Um, and if you validate that people really dig it and they you know, they love certain parts of the track or the vibe of the track, then you can take that and turn it into a full blown sequence. Uh, again, recording it in real time, just using the faders to create uh, when parts come in and out. Um, and then maybe you do a, a couple of uh, takes of that and comp it together into your first structure. But I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later on. So that's the reason why we only have eight tracks. The beauty of using the system is that you can control a whole live set and all your tracks with just a standard eight fader controller. Um, and uh, this is actually a trick uh, or a trick, you know, something that I've seen Frank Wiedemann do. And a lot of musicians tend to do this. Some of them use 12 faders, you know, there's, there's different ways to do this. But the idea is that you have a very simple overview of what you have going on so that you have a chance to actually control it all in real time. And I've, I've played many live sets like this using this system. And it's incredibly fun because you can really, you know, you're not fixed to a fixed structure of some sequence you've created maybe or certain lengths of clips or anything because you can just interact with the people and bring things in and out uh, as they are needed. Um, so let's look a little bit deeper into the uh, individual tracks. Uh, for example, here you will see that uh, in the drums track we have just a basic selection of uh, kick drums, hi-hats and claps and snares, etc. And if you uh, look into the um, effects of uh, these, you will see that there's a lot going on. So the first EQ here is to adapt your drum sounds to a PA maybe that's not doing what you need. You know, maybe you, you need a little bit of uh, extra low end or something. You can fix that quickly here for a live set. Um, but generally uh, the idea or the goal is to hopefully try to keep things as neutral as possible um, in your basic standard template. We do some low cutting here because many, many kick drums tend to have way too much sub information that then clogs up your limiter and reduces the amount of loudness that you can reach. Um, we have uh, activated a filter which is mapped to the master fader. Uh, so the master fader is not that useful on stage. Either you lose your sound or you start clipping. So this is again learned from Frank Biedemann. Uh, this is mapped to the kick drums and the bass line so that you can create kind of a drop uh, or a break uh, just by removing the, the low frequencies only on the kick and bass. Let me show you. So nice little trick uh, that allows you to actually make use of the master fader. 
uh, what else do we have? We have a peak limiter, and then this tool is the, to gain so that the, the drums sound correct when your fader is all the way up. Using peak limiters on individual tracks is something that I've seen uh, many people do. Uh, Deadmau5 was the first person that I saw speaking about this a few years ago. Uh, Skrillex, I think, also does very similar things. A lot of people do this because it means if you're keeping the dynamics a little bit more controlled throughout your set, and then sending a signal that already has quite a high RMS value to your uh, master channel, the limiter and compressors there don't have to work as hard. So you're splitting the load kind of across um, the template or, or your project, and you will see limiters on almost every channel in uh, the set. The second reason why they are there is because um, this helps you so that when you start adding your sounds, if it's not mixed correctly, if a kick drum isn't cutting through, it has too much low end, you'll see that the uh, limiter will start grabbing it. So you can't kind of go wrong uh, and add samples that will be way too loud and will kind of unbalance the whole mix because the limiters in the channels will protect you from that. So it's... Um, yeah, some, like one or two people have asked us, like, ah, oh, I can't get this and that to work. And, you know, usually with, uh, for example, kick drums or basses, it tends to be because it's either doesn't have enough mids or highs or presence or punch or too much low end. And, and for example, when you record your uh, sounds for that in, in you know, in the ones you want to add, I really recommend uh, to also experiment a bit with uh, things like harmonic distortion, um, transient designers and things like that to make sure that your sounds are correct not only from a frequency spectrum but also from a sort of forwardness in the mix. Um, let's have a look uh, at the bass channel. Uh, you see a same um, um, infra bass clean. In this case it's actually off because all these samples have already been processed in such a way that uh, they already sound correct but if you end up with something in your set in a live set that's clogging the PA uh, you can just switch that in. Again, we have that master fader. This time it's just cutting uh, frequencies from the bass lines. Uh, we have an EQ for adjusting your uh, bass in uh, clubs. If you realize, ah, my bass is way too much sub-frequency or it's not cutting through, you know, you can just grab this quickly to, to fix something. Again, a trick learned from uh, Mr. Wiedemann, which makes so much sense. I remember he learned it from someone else, but I can't remember who he said that he picked that up from. But it's, yeah, it just makes a lot of sense. Again, we have a peak limiter that's protecting you from adding too much level uh, to your basses. Let's have a look. So as you can see, this is, this is on the edge. Uh, it's on the edge. It, it's not doing anything. But if you start adding other basses, some of them do uh, go into the limiter a little bit. Most of these yeah that last one was a little bit into the limiter so everything's kind of set that if if you've put your clips in correctly you're not really limiting very much but if you start to add stuff that's very loud the limiter is gonna it's gonna catch it for you this actually also has a sidechain uh, compressor on it. We've set up uh, the template in such a way that you can just drop a dynamics processor. You can copy this one and drop it anywhere and immediately have a sidechain active. Uh, so this sidechain channel here is sending um, a kick drum to a bus that's running to all the compressors that have uh, a sidechain activated. Uh, looks like here we've forgotten to add it. Uh, going back to the base, what else do we have on here? That's it. Um, so it's very similar for like, you know, the groove element. So like, let's say the, the toms, uh, you know, the percussions and the leads, etc. They all have already a whole bunch of sound engineering applied to them uh, so that you are set up to get a really good sound or to fix things quickly on stage if you realize something that you've uh, designed sound-wise isn't quite working. Um, about the routing of the project, um, I think this is an important point. It's maybe a little bit on, well, not unorthodox. It's just a different way of doing things. There are two channels that you will see here called Super Channel and Mastering. Mastering is pretty obvious. There's a big fat mastering chain uh, here, which is doing a lot to improve the quality of the sound. Uh, let me give you an idea of what that sounds like on and off. So as you can see, it's doing a whole lot. And 
what I've learned over the years is that, um, and this is very much a personal preference, you know, some people like to do it a very different way. They do everything in the tracks. Uh, some people like to keep their master bus as clean as possible. I've eventually landed on the way that actually a lot of old school mix engineers do it, which is having um, pretty strong processing, EQ and compression uh, going on on the master bus. In my case, even limiting and mixing into that because then I know what it's going to sound like sort of in the ballpark when a, mix, a mastering engineer or myself masters it. Um, so when you remove the uh, mastering chain to send to a, a mastering engineer, the levels that you will get out of the template are, um, uh, are not that high. Let me show you here. So as you can see on the meter, um, and before you ask, this meter is uh, not included in the template. This is the amazing Flux Analyzer. I'm just using it to do visualize things for you here. Uh, you can see that uh, the maximum uh, is minus, where is it? Uh, let me just reset these uh, meters a bit. There we go. Okay, let's have a listen again. So the true peak in this case is at uh, minus 16. So it leaves you loads of space as a mastering engineer to um, process this, the, the mix down that they get with um, external outboard, with uh, plugins that model the behavior of external outboard, which are actually not that happy to get super uh, loud input signals. Um, and you know you can you can gain it up a bit using a utility gain or something like you know up to maybe minus nine minus eight or whatever. But one of the biggest jumps that I did in the quality of my mixing was not having such loud signals in the channels and gradually boosting things up as it goes uh, towards the master. I read a long thread about this on uh, Gearspace where um, it was one of the recommendations because a lot of the plugins we use, especially stuff like UAD, you know, that has a lot of old analog gear modeled, does not expect to see a signal at the input for the modeling that's like minus 3 dB full scale. Uh, you know, um, uh, 0 dB VU, I think it's like minus 18 dB full scale, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and if you go into those kinds of modeling plugins with a lower signal like that, uh, the quality that you get through their processing is way, way better. Uh, I always also, I used to have like, my signals really loud in the channels. When I stopped doing that, my mixes immediately improved. It was one of my biggest learnings, uh, thanks to the Gearspace community for that. Um, yeah, so coming back, let me switch back in the mastering chain. I think that's pretty straightforward, but I'll take you through it quickly. We do a little bit of gain adjustment. Uh, you can bring in a, a, a mono bass maker if you need it for whatever it is that you've done on the track. There's an EQ in there that uh, cuts a bit of the uh, low mids, which tends to create mud uh, in many tracks. The things just sound kind of punchier and cleaner. This is sort of engineer, sound engineering best practices. Uh, then we have a mids lift and a high lift. Uh, and you'll see that this lift doesn't go all the way up until the ultra high frequencies around 18 to 20k because these frequencies, when they're loud on a PA, they tend to just really sizzle and hurt your ears. Um, it's not so nice. I even sometimes put de on hi-hats. Uh, it sounds much more pleasant at loud volumes. This was a tip picked up from uh, Ein Musik, who talks about it in his master class on Sign. Um, it's in Ger I think it's in German, I'm not quite sure, on Sign, uh, a really cool company also that's doing a lot of great work with templates and master classes with artists. So that was a really helpful learning. Uh, there is some multiband dynamics going on, uh, which is all uh, linked back here. And then finally, there is a clipper. And what the clipper is doing is it's just catching the biggest peaks that are coming off of your mix down to make sure that your uh, bus comp and limiter afterwards don't have to work as hard. So for example, if sometimes you have a bass note hitting on a, on a kick drum, which some people frown upon, but I like to have the option to do that. The clipper will grab that to make sure that it doesn't sound kind of all of a sudden way louder. Um, and generally it's just kind of keeping the dynamic range of your mix a little bit more compact, but it's not like a huge difference. It's just every, all these little pieces are doing little bits. So you can see we're right on the edge of that. Uh, there's a bus compressor, which is again doing just a bit of minor compression and kind of gluing the signals together. Again, the sound engineering best practice. And then we have a, a limiter set up. And this is right now set up for streaming or for uh, you know platforms that expect to get files no louder than minus one dB full scale. I know a lot of people master louder than that also, but since uh, I think it's Apple Music and, and Spotify, I think Apple Music primarily recommend not to send files louder than that. That's what 
what we've set it to for you. You can, however, grab another dB of gain here if you want to go out at like minus 0.03 dB full scale, for example, which for live sets, I think I would bother, you know, I would do. Um, yeah, again, here's a, a tool uh, which, which you can adjust uh, levels or uh, things like that, but we, we've just put it in there in case you need it while you're playing live, but right now it's uh, not active. Now, the way the routing goes, it's not that all these tracks go into the mastering chain. They actually go to the super channel first. And the super channel is, is something interesting uh, from a concept point of view that allows you to interact with all of these sounds in real time on stage. So if I play the track and show you what uh, the uh, controllers at the top of the APC here have been mapped to, you will see that they take quite a strong influence on the sound. So that was obviously the low cut here. Let me open these up so you can see them a bit better. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Anything else? Okay, cool. So uh, here you will see, for example, the low cut, high cut. We have a washout. We have a reverb. Uh, further back here, we have uh, two delays, a short one and a long one. Then we have a phaser. Uh, and the final uh, rotary knob, of some wrong controller here, uh, on my um, APC is reserved for the decays of the hi-hats that I showed you earlier. So the first seven are all to interact with your sound uh, live on stage. Um, so all of these sounds are being routed to the super channel, which means that between the faders and the controllers of the super channel, you can create build-ups live in real time and just play with the people and experiment and kind of see, you know, what they like, you know, where it's going. Uh, let me just show you that very quickly, like a, a little quick demo. Or you could, for example, just take your bass. That's something I like to do a lot also. Stuff like that. Uh, with practice, uh, yeah, it, it becomes really fun to just mess around with stuff and, and create your build-ups and breakdowns in real time uh, using your controller and just the clips that you have looping in your set. Um, so as I said, all of these tracks are going to the Super Channel. Um, and it has two functions. One is live performance effects, but the other is that if you're creating stuff in the back here, which is the compose section, all of this is also routed to the super channel. So if you're making a sound back here, uh, let's take, uh, if you've bought one of our larger bundles, not just the template, but for example, the low end bundle or the power pack, you will get in the low end bundle, these analog kick drums and this uh, short percussive bass and the power pack has the uh, sem bass. So these are sampled instruments that we have in the studio here. Let me give you a quick look. This is the clone of a SEM. It's the Telemark by Analog Solutions that we recorded note by note to make that instrument. And over there is, a, is an ARP 2600 clone from Behringer that we recorded uh, for this percussive bass here. Uh, so if you bought that, you will have these files. Let me demo to you very quickly just what this sounds like and especially what you can do with the uh, Super Channel while you're producing. So that's the short percussive bass and I could now take uh, the Super Channel and use that to just make maybe some kind of an effect sound or you know maybe if you're sending a pad it would make more sense but let's let's just add some stuff to this to give you an idea a demonstration So assuming now that uh, that's the sound that I want to go for I could record that into this resample cell um, and that's exactly the sound that I am capturing uh, off of the uh, super channel 
and then grab that and drop it into uh, the track that I'm going to be using. So you can see the super channel like kind of your one channel to process all kinds of stuff happening in your set, either live or while you're composing and creating sound clips. Because uh, you kind of always need like some compression, some EQ, you know, some low cut, high cuts, maybe a bit of reverb, maybe a bit of delay. Um, so it's just a really fast way to work because actually you have a controller also then set up on your desk with which you can control the whole process of actually creating clips, which is a, a really, really nice way to go. Uh, and of course, you know, if, if you, there's other effects that you use more often or third party plugins, then of course, you know, replace them and map them. Uh, but I think the concept here uh, really helps uh, to make uh, music more quickly. But let's have a quick listen while we're at it uh, to some of these uh, kick drums and, and these basses. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of analog kick drums also that we sampled from a whole bunch of uh, yeah, pretty famous drum machines. Still have a little bit of reverb going on, it seems. Hang on, let me get rid of this, okay. So here you can hear some of the kick drums that we've recorded. And there's also a uh, long uh, sustain bass, which is uh, the SEM recording. Let me show that to you quickly. So you can use that for sidechain bass, for droning basses and things like that. Uh, the kick drum sample pack actually contains samples from, yeah, you can see it here, uh, 606, 808, 909, um, it has the MFB Tanspare MK1, which has amazing kick drums. It has the Vermona DRM1 MK4, uh, the Moog DFAM, and am I forgetting anything? I think that's it. That's, uh, that's what's in there. So I used to own a 909. I used to have access to an 808 uh, and a 606. So I've uh, just rec I, I had recordings of those kick drums and took them in here, cleaned them up, and tweaked them so that um, yeah, they sound uh, really strong in your production. So if you want to get analog kick drum sounds or analog basses, uh, I recommend you this package with either the low end bundle uh, or the power pack, which has all three. The low end bundle only has the analog kick drums and the short percussive bass. Uh, you can ignore this last channel here. This is just a multi-clock which sends signal to my multi-clock so that everything in the studio gets synced, but this will not be present in your template. Um, yes, where were we? Uh, the super channel. So the, the it doubles as either live performance effects or as a way to, uh, to create and compose sounds. Uh, I mentioned the mastering chain. We have a side chain here, which uh, I've shown to you. One other thing that's built into the template is a way to reference uh, your track in progress with professional mixes. So I've just dropped one of my um, master tracks in here as a reference, and this is mapped to the crossfader on the APC. Uh, so when the crossfader is on the left, you hear your production. Actually, let me go back to one of the demo tracks. Let's switch over to another demo track. Okay, cool. So uh, right now, the crossfader is on the left position. If I switch over to the right, I'm going to switch over to this uh, reference track that's played here. And of course, load up the reference tracks of the style that you like here. Of course, use WAV files. Uh, support your artist and, and buy some WAV files of one of the platforms and make sure that you have you know, a good selection of tracks that you can reference for the low end, for the mids, for the loudness, for the presence, for the 3D space, whatever it is that is important to you. So let me play you the demo track and um, compare it to my mix down, or sorry, to my master track. As you can see, with just the crossfader, I can switch between my track in progress uh, and whatever reference track it is that you want to uh, have. The cool thing about having your mastering chain as a bus in your project and not on the output is that you can do this. You can send both of these signals to your main output, to your main master uh, output channel. Um, and hear them at equal loudness because you're processing your project in progress so that it's the same loudness as uh, the track that you're actually referring to, which is something that, 
you know, it took me years to figure out how to find an elegant way to do this somehow. Um, I, you know, you know how it is when you're trying to reference against uh, release tracks and your track is just not sounding as loud, etc. This is a really good workaround for that. So having the mastering uh, as a bus in your channel with everything feeding into it has a lot of advantages. Um, so then the last thing that we can cover here to look at the overview of the template is the compose section. Uh, in here you have a couple of kind of, you know, things that we've uh, put in here to um, allow you or make it easy for you to compose. You know, we have like a MIDI track, we have a resampling track, we have an internal instrument or audio file track, and then here are some instrument tracks uh, that I mentioned before, which are the um, uh, sample sets that we've created. So the idea is that you compose, like let's say you wanted to make a new track, you know, you were starting here on scene 30. What you would do is compose your clips and everything here. Probably, you know, what I usually end up doing is just grabbing a kick over here somewhere. Uh, and I would start here. Uh, so I would start here and then here I would start to cr create or write a baseline, for example, you know, uh, bring it in here, uh, make a MIDI clip, etc, etc, and, and start uh, writing a bass. Um, and once I have it sounding the way that I want, I would uh, resample it here and take that finalized clip and drop it into the template. Now what I would really, really recommend to you is don't fix deficiencies in the clips you create in these individual tracks. Consider them like, in, like a kind of hyper eight track tape machine with a lot of cool settings. But if you start to, you know, fix a problem in the bass clip you created in this EQ, you'll have to automate it for just that clip. And then when you go to another track or you move things around, it's going to get really confusing. Uh, trust me, because I've messed up my own life set like that. Um, so, the idea is that you get your clip sounding as perfect as you can in the compose section and when you have them done, drop them into the A-Track tape machine. Um, and you know, these are really just reserved for live fixes. Otherwise, like, yeah, just things will get super, super confusing. And especially on stage, you know, late in the night or in a festival, you want things to be as simple as, as possible so you can't mess up uh, when you're out there and you're wondering maybe why is my bass line all of a sudden super bassy when I'm going from one scene to the other. Maybe, you know, the next scene forgot to switch off the automation or something like that. So I uh, really recommend you to keep things as simple as possible in the first eight tracks and do all of the heavy lifting in the compose track. And that means committing to audio. Yes. Now that's a very philosophical uh, question. I think for many of us, I've learned over the years that by committing to audio, you get much, much faster. The things that we decide early on are very often right. Obviously, it'll take a, a bunch of load off of your CPU uh, and it'll just keep you moving. It'll keep you moving forward. Not keeping all your options open till the very, very end means that you'll have uh, way less things to tweak and to break along the way. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, very often the things that you decide early on in your project actually sound really good. And if you ever get stuck with the tools we have at our disposal these days, you can take any piece of audio and kind of do anything with it. So you can always fix things up. Uh, and you know, if, if all has been shot to hell, uh, you can just load an earlier version of the project you were working on, obviously, you know, save incrementally um, and, and load up that bit again and make sure that you get it right uh, the second time. But I found very often that um, that's very rarely necessary. Um, so that's the idea with, uh, with that. I do know people actually that have replaced the first A tracks with um, instrument tracks and have VSTs running there. Cool, amazing. I think that's a super cool idea. In my live set, actually, for the percussion stuff and for the hi hats, I have separate tracks where I have uh, what are the guys called again? Microtonic uh, running, uh, which is why I have this second controller on my desk with which, as you can maybe read here, I just control three tracks, just control hi-hats uh, and some percussion. So, you know, there's many, many ways to do this. Uh, but especially if you're a beginner, I really recommend to keep things as simple as possible. And, and this is what we've built for you here in a way. Uh, with this setup, you know, literally you can make uh, tracks in an hour or two. Uh, so sketches for a track. Uh, and play them out live. We, we've done it many times. Uh, we sat right here with a friend of mine, Sander, what's up? And uh, yeah, we wrote like three tracks, four tracks, I think it was, what was it five? It was a bunch in one afternoon and played them in a club uh, the next weekend and validated which were the best ones and worked on them. Some of them actually, one of them found it into the set actually. Let me show you. Yeah. 
this was one of the tracks that I uh, worked on with my mate Sander, and uh, he was kind enough also to say, yeah, cool, you can share it and, and put it in here. So um, obviously, if you're using Outboard, you can just record stuff uh, in here and, uh, you know, track it hopefully in so it sounds good or just process it with plugins and then resample it and then drop it into your um, tracks at the template. Um, what else do we have that's important? Uh, let me have a look. I think the, the only other thing uh, that uh, I would like to show you which is important is the workflow for um, making your tracks in real time. Uh, let me show you that to you quickly. Okay, so let's look at how you can use uh, your controller to make your tracks in real time. Uh, let me bring up the arrange window. Uh, so now if I, if you can see all of these clips here already set up to play, but on the mixer, uh, some of their levels have been pulled down. So what I'm hearing now is uh, basically the uh, way I've set up my track, let's say to start uh, what this track ID or sequence could be like. As you see, I've now started to lay out an idea for a sequence. So if I play this back, there we go. I now have like uh, the build up or the opening of a track and obviously like this with your faders and all the live performance effects and all the other stuff, you can create like a whole idea or a rough sketch of a track and, and just follow your intuition, your feeling of when you feel like things should come in and out. And once you've done that, or maybe you've done a couple of takes, you can then go in and comp them if you want, or just, you know, in some sense, make a sequence that just feels more organic and alive than when you're just copying blocks around the screen, which forgive me, but I've been doing this for so long, I hate it. <laughs> I really hate making sequences by playing Tetris for hours. Uh, I don't know, it feels too much like data entry on an Excel sheet to me. So I really love this way of working, which is something that I learned in master classes from Sebastian Müllert, who, by the way, yeah, he has an amazing master class on uh, Circle of Live. Uh, there's links actually to all the masterclasses that I mention in this video on my website. If you go to uh, rapidflow.shop, it says masterclasses. If you have a chance to join uh, the classes linked on there or, or watch them, uh, they are super, super good. Uh, they've really helped me a lot. And actually a lot of the learnings, like some of the key things that I learned in those classes have gone into this template. Once I figured out how to do this myself uh, much, much quicker, I just wanted to share it with other musicians. Uh, which is uh, why we made this. And because our, our mission, maybe it's an important little detail, because our mission is to share the knowledge about music production with as many musicians as possible, uh, we also do offer the most basic, so the basic template, which doesn't have the sample kits, it's, uh, it's available for free on our store. So if you're seeing this and you think this is awesome, but I can't afford it, man, it sucks, uh, you can just grab it for free on our store. There's a code that's shown to you in the chat bot. Um, obviously, we're super grateful and we need your support to keep this all going. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the main thing that I do uh, with uh, a couple of friends that support me in, you know, preparing all this stuff. But if you'd love to just use this workflow and you don't have the money right now, please feel free to download a copy for free. Uh, and we hope that you're able to support us at some point where you're a famous, uh, maybe a super rich musician and then you can go, I can give Eric and his team a tip maybe. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, this is, uh, I think, the most important things. Now, one final detail is missing that I need to show you so that you can work with this template properly. Um, and obviously, that is how to do the um, mapping uh, of these things. Um, and. I mean, most of you that, that do this, uh, you know, if, if, you've, if you're experienced with all this, you know exactly how to do this. But for those that, uh, that are not so experienced, I'm just going to show you quickly. Um, when you have a track selected, for example, in this case, it's the drum track, uh, you'll see that there's macros uh, there and they're already labeled. So all you have to do here is click uh, map to controller or key. 
uh, in this case, it's the Hyatt decay. So on my APC, I'm going to map it to the last button, which is also labeled with a bit of tape here to Hyatt decay, and that's it. Uh, same here, I can map uh, this to my master fader. There you go. Um, and uh, that's already set now. Um, the way we've done this is that these function in a limited range because if you, you know, low cut your kick drum up to 20 kilohertz, you're not going to hear anything of it anymore, which is not that useful. Um, the main mapping is on the super channel. There you have the first seven buttons on your um, controller. So again, you know, just right click, map to controller or key. This is the low cut. I go over to my APC, map it to the low cut, uh, and uh, there you go. It's mapped. Uh, so you just do the same process for the next uh, six buttons on your controller, and then you're all set. You're ready to go. The faders. Uh, map automatically to whatever is selected in the yellow box. Be careful if you group these tracks. I've, we had that for a little while and then realized the mapping uh, wasn't working anymore because it was seeing everything grouped as one track. Um, but yeah, it's, it's super, super easy to use. And whoever made the file to make the APC work on um, uh, Bitwig, uh, I was chatting with, uh, with the, the guys from Bitwig are actually friends. I was chatting with um, Placidos. And he told me, I think it was some of his guys from the Bitwig team that made this and, and yeah, mapped the, the APC into Bitwig. Uh, whoever did this, thank you so much. I was happy as a child on Christmas when I realized the APC was just working with Bitwig because it's like my main controller that I've been using on Ableton so far. Uh, and maybe here a little shameless plug is that after now uh, doing um, this project of mapping everything. As you may know, we started out on Ableton and now we are releasing on Bitwig. Uh, big, big shout out to Bill Fuller, who was recommended to us from the Be Bitwig beta test team, who actually did all the heavy lifting. He made this template. Uh, like He took my Ableton template and made all of this into Bitwig. Bill, you're amazing. It was awesome to work with you. Thank you so much for making this so great. Um, yeah, and um, after hearing the way Bitwig sounds and working with it now, I am actually now switching over to Bitwig as my main door. It sounds incredible. The low end is so tight and punchy. It somehow feels different uh, the way it's laid out. It just somehow feels more clean and more organized. Initially, I was a bit shocked by all the colors and stuff, but I'm actually starting to really enjoy it now. Uh, so big shout out uh, to uh, Bill. And uh, thank you, Placidos, for uh, this NFR and uh, yeah, to the whole team over at Bitwig for making, for example, the APC work and for uh, creating an incredible piece of software. I'm really, really enjoying it. It definitely does feel like the next generation of this concept of a session and a linear view. Uh, very much loving to work with it and look forward to working with it as my main DAW in the future. So that is it, I think, from me. Am I forgetting anything for this video manual? I don't think so. Uh, I think everything is in there. Um, I hope, uh, or we hope, uh, speaking for the whole uh, RapidFlow team, that uh, this template and this way of working really helps you uh, to make more tracks, to be more creative and inspired in the studio, to not get, not get caught in a rut of you know, spending too much time on small details to get really great sounding mixes. Uh, if you're a beginner, if you're an advanced producer, I think there's still a lot of stuff in here that's going to help you. Uh, the workflow that I showed you making tracks in real time with controllers is so much fun. Uh, just try it out. And um, in any case, if for any reason you're not happy with something you buy in our store, we always offer a money back guarantee on everything we do. Uh, we are musicians ourselves. We know how much it sucks when you buy something and then it doesn't deliver what you hoped for. So if it doesn't deliver value to you, you don't pay. You just write us on the chat. We'll refund you immediately. No questions asked. Uh, because either it's something that really helps you or we don't want your money. <laughs> you can spend it on something else that will uh, move you along your production career. Uh, yes, so that's it uh, for me today. Uh, we are really grateful for your feedback and for your support. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments or on social media. Um, and yeah, have a great time in the studio and uh, we'll see you on the next video. All right, take care. Bye-bye.